What is human potential? Just how far can it take us? What if I were to tell you that the purpose of our highest potential is to transcend limited thinking and bring it into superhuman or cosmic consciousness? Hi, I'm Ben Stewart. Welcome to the nexus point between your old life and your new self. In this series, we will be unlocking the deepest mysteries of our human potential. And as with all great journeys, we will begin with the unparalleled power of the question mark. Just what are we capable of? When you look at yourself in the mirror, do you see that which you are right now, the finished product, no more, no less? Or do you see that which you are capable of becoming? The only thing standing between you, who and what you are now, and a future filled with unlimited possibilities is a belief that you hold about you and the world that you live in. So when I say the words full potential or peak potential, what does that conjure up in your mind? What do you think of? Do you think of the people that can lift the heaviest weights, run the fastest, jump the highest, hold their breath the longest? What about withstanding the most extreme conditions? Or super memory, super recall, the ability to read faster than anybody else? Are these the things you think of? And mind you that everything that I've just mentioned are truly the outward or more masculine qualities. What about the feminine qualities, the ones that are more hidden, such as intuition, grace in the face of great adversity, compassion when it's needed most, and fertility, being pregnant with possibility. These are less measurable and so less talked about, but they're just as, if not more, important in the path of our greatest potential. So I liken our human potential with a seed or a plant. Once the conditions are set, enough food, water, light, it will simply grow. No force required. In fact, force will only hinder it. So are the conditions for your potential to grow set? And if not, what's holding you back? Are there people, forces, situations, vows and commitments that you've made, a form of self-sabotage that you engage in that holds you back from what you could become. So I'll ask you one more question. The word impossible, what does it mean to you? If you think of it, this word will inscribe itself into your brain and into your behavior. So be very careful of how you define that word. Now the brain isn't the only and most important organ that we have, but it is the one that neuroscientists and modern science seems to focus on the most. So let's just start right there. The brain two hemispheres and three lobes, very uniquely set up. And even though there's been a little bit of a myth in the past that the right hemisphere is completely creative and the left hemisphere is totally logical, this has been dispelled to a bit, but neuroimaging has helped us see that we do have two distinct brains and they think distinctly different. So now let's take a look at a series called Steps Away From The Future. This episode called The Hidden Side of the Brain will show you something about the evolution of our brain that you may not have known. Of course, talking about the left side and the right side of the brain is a simplification. Our brain isn't a map, as people used to assume naively in the last century. It's characterized by an astonishing plasticity, which localizes on the right side of the brain functions that are on the left side in other people, Nevertheless, in most cases, the functions of analysis and logical reasoning are on the left, whereas visual and intuitive functions are on the right. There's a snowstorm on the little city of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. This is where Dr. Dale Treffert lives. This psychiatrist has dedicated 40 years of his life to the savant syndrome. We are a left hemisphere society. We depend on our left hemisphere. It serves us well, logical, sequential thinking language, things that have served us well. They serve us so well that we begin to use only that well-worn pathway, sort of to the neglect of the, of, of the rest of the brain, the right hemisphere. Yeah, some people call that 
the tyranny of the left hemisphere. Now the human brain went from 1,440 grams about 150,000 years ago, and then it put it into reverse and brought it back to 1,300 grams, meaning our brain has shrunk in the past 150,000 years. So the question we must ask ourselves is why? There's a book called Return to the Brain of Eden by Tony Wright and Graham Jinn, and they've done amazing work looking at just this question. In this book, they also talk about savant syndrome, the amazing ability for our brain to be able to incur some kind of a damage, and then the healthy parts of the brain take over those functionalities. These savants actually have a gift that no one else has. Now we're going to go back to Steps Away from the Future and that episode, The Hidden Side of the Brain, because they dive a little bit deeper into the savant syndrome. Kim Peek was the inspiration for the movie Rain Man, and I was a consultant to the movie, and that's where we first met. Uh, Kim is what I call the Mount Everest of memory. Uh, he has uh, memorized 12,000 books, uh, word for word. He has a factual memory within 15 areas of expertise that simply history, biography, the Bible, you simply cannot uh, stump him. And one of the most amazing things about him is that he reads so quickly he reads one page with one eye and he reads the other page with the other eye and immediately goes to his hard disk and it's stored there. I keep saying at some point the image has to come up disk full, but it never does. The human brain is divided into two hemispheres and they have two very different functions. And so this is a human brain. And so you're looking now at the external surface of the brain. This is the left hemisphere, this is the right hemisphere. And you can see here that they're divided into two halves. And the two hemispheres process different kinds of information in different ways. So the right hemisphere is all about experiencing the present moment. It's all about right here, right now. In the right here, right now, there are no boundaries. Everything is perceived as energy. And so the atoms and molecules just experience the energy and they blend with one another so that there's the big picture vision. So the right hemisphere thinks in pictures and it's all about the right here, right now. The left hemisphere takes that present moment experience and then breaks it down into details. And part of the details is our language, our ability to speak, our ability to make sound, our ability to place meaning on that sound. And part of that sound is my ability to say, I am. I am an individual. And as soon as I say I am, then I exist separate from all of the energy around me. So the two hemispheres work together in order for us to have a single perception of reality. And so there is that huge store of material in all of us. And the question is, how can we access that without having an injury or some kind of uh, central nervous system catastrophe? And that's where our research is leading us these days. The process of neuroplasticity is the ability for our brain and certain regions of it to adopt functions of the injured portions of the brain. But without injury, you can still prompt neuroplasticity, which is the restructuring of your brain. Simply by things like new and novel forms of moving the body, outside the box ways of thinking, and also sinking the body and mind very intelligently. And these are ways that without injury, we can actually prompt neuroplasticity, the restructuring of our brain. There's even tasks like using your less dominant hand to write, to brush your teeth, open doors with, shake hands with, even using your less dominant foot to kick or jump or take your first step with. These things prompt neuroplasticity. But the question I have for you now is how far can neuroplasticity truly take us? Let's take a look at a film called Sonic Magic, The Wonder of Science and Sound. Bats actually see with sound. Perhaps even more astonishing is the fact that some humans are able to do the same thing. So we've got a tree here. I'll turn here. By 13 months of age, Daniel Kish had lost both eyes to a cancer called retinoblastoma. 
Instinctively, he soon began to make clicking sounds and started to echolocate just like bats do. Those clicks you hear are from his mouth, not the tapping of his cane. Big open area, but we're approaching a structure. He calls this flash sonar. Flash sonar has become Kish's primary means of navigation. So in my case, it wasn't something I was really aware of. It just happened as a consequence of my childhood experiences. I get an image that occurs in a 360 degree field. The roof structure we're under isn't totally solid somehow. It's got uh, openings in it as if it were slatted or I describe them as fuzzy geometry, moving, dynamic figures. They have depth and contour and character, and they provide me with information about location, density. And you can also kind of hear things around corners, and you can hear things through objects. So, you know, it almost has this kind of omnipresence about it. As a kid, I was raised to think of myself as, as pretty unremarkable. My parents, their emphasis, their regard for me was you're, you're a kid like any other kid. We asked him to draw a picture, to recreate from memory the image he got from nothing more than the sound of clicks. I'll just do a little dashed line here. And remember, he had never set foot in this pavilion before today. And then we had another column kind of across the way here. Definitely taxing my artistic merits here. Should I say ta-da? Ta-da! The accuracy of the image is uncanny. It shows that there's an actual imaging process taking place. You're using sound instead of light to create a picture. We are truly adaptable creatures. I think that's what this video showed me. And Daniel Kish is one of the best examples of this. He didn't injure his brain, he injured his eyes, yet his brain still adapted. He received the gift that most anybody in the world will never receive, simply because the conditions arose and he said yes to the challenge. So now I wanna ask you that first question again. What does impossible mean to you? And are you willing to believe that you can't do something if you've never tried it? I wanna bring your attention to some people who have overcome extreme adversity. One of them is Viktor Frankl. In World War II, he was experimented on and tortured. In many ways, all the people around him that were healthier, stronger, smarter, all of their life expectancies were dropping to zero, and many of them were dying. They couldn't fathom the amount of pain that they were under, but Victor survived. He did so, and he said later why, why he believes he survived such incredible atrocities. And it was because he knew that he must tell people about his journey. He had some work to do in the future. This gave him purpose that superseded all of the pain and the suffering he was going through. Victor is quoted as saying, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Another example is Stephen Hawking. He had a malleotrophic lateral sclerosis, a British scientist with amazing accomplishments. He fathered children, he authored many very pivotal scientific books, all without the use of his body. Then there's Frida Kahlo, stricken with polio at an early age, suffered a very severe car accident, and had chronic pain in her back for the rest of her life, in a way that most people would be bedridden, but not Frida. She knew she had to paint. She knew she had to express herself. So she did, and she became a renowned painter. Then there's Helen Keller, born deaf and blind. And despite these setbacks, despite two of her greatest sense organs being taken from her, from birth, she still authored about 400 articles, 
several books, was involved in women's rights and politics. And even Albert Einstein, thought to have dyslexia and maybe even Asperger's, didn't speak until the age of four. Although he is one of the most celebrated scientific minds in history, he is quoted as saying, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it is stupid. Side note, none of these individuals went down in history as the people with poor luck. They are known for incredible accomplishments. Now I want to bring it deeper. The shamans. Stories of shamans that go back many, many thousands of years. Many of these stories actually begin when the shaman suffered some kind of an injury or had a fever that prompted innate capacities to come out that they never knew they had. So by taking a look at these stories, were these individuals just the crazy people in the society? Not the shamans. The shamans were looked at as one of the most respected and heralded positions in any tribe. The information that they would bring back to the tribe was so useful that they were one of the most respected roles you could imagine in any tribe. And one hallmark of shamans is entering an altered state. One of the biggest ways they did this was through the use of psychedelic plants. Now we're going to take a look at a Gaia original series called Psychedelica. One of the fundamental effects of psychedelics is to integrate material that's normally not accessible to consciousness. And the fundamental way in which psychedelics make this information available is by a destabilizing of what's called the default mode network. This part of the brain that integrates our sense of self, our autobiographical memories, and our reflection upon our lives. So basically what's happening under psychedelics is a liberation of the parts of the brain that 80 or 90% of the brain that they say we don't use. I mean, we use it, but we're just not able to access it. Psychedelics give us access to that unconscious. The language facility in the brain is destabilized as well. So the combination of our self-identity and our language being put off balance by simply ingesting a plant gives rise to the ineffability of the experience. Just as we see with any mystical or spiritual experience, words are not enough to communicate the magnitude of the experience. I want to reiterate what Michael Winkleman said right there. 80 to 90% of our brains that we're not accessing. Now this brings up a myth, and the myth is that we only use 10% of our brains. But that's talking about neural activity. It's not talking about potential. And this is where the myth comes in. Because George Leonard actually explains in the 1960s, he researched 37 psychiatrists, brain researchers, and specialists on the topic of human potential. And he said not one of them were quoted as saying that we use more than 10% of our power, our ability to learn and perform calculating and creative cognitive tasks. George Leonard wrote a book called Mastery. And he says, we fail to realize that mastery is not about perfection. It's about a process, a journey. And the master is the one who stays on the path day after day, year after year. The master is the one who is willing to try and fail and try again for as long as he or she lives. So now I want to ask you again, a question that I asked you before. What is holding you back from the rest of your potential? And if you keep going beneath all the layers, deeper and deeper, you'll come to realize what most people come to realize when they ask these questions. And that's the only thing holding you back is you. Author and podcaster Tim Ferriss said that fear is your friend. It is an indicator. Oftentimes it will show you what you shouldn't do but more often than not, it shows you what you should do. Meaning that there's a gift hidden, encrypted inside all of our fears. And instead of running from them, ignoring them, pushing them away, actually embracing them, facing them, and seeing what they have to say is where the true gift lies. I personally believe that we are not held back by conditions or principles of the universe. As much as we are held back by a lack of imagination, 
and a lack of clarity on what we truly want to work towards in our lives. We know that the power of belief is something that is talked about, sometimes is exaggerated about, but the placebo effect is one example of the incredible power of the mind and belief. We know that all pharmaceutical trials have to set up and beat the placebo effect in order to go to market. And we give all the credit to the pharmaceuticals, but we don't give any credit to the placebo effect, the power of belief. And the reductionists and the scientists may scoff at this and say that we exaggerate a little bit too much, but if something works, it simply works. And the power of belief does just that. We're living in a very unique world, one that we scarcely understand. Even the scientists will agree on this. Albert Einstein, who we already mentioned, one of the most celebrated scientific minds in all of history, is quoted as saying that time and space are modes by which we think and not conditions in which we live. Think about that, that's a powerful statement. One of the fathers of modern science saying that time and space are not conditions outside of us, but modes by which we think. And thinking can be changed. At the same time that Albert Einstein fathered one branch of science being modern physics, another branch was birthed. And this is the branch of quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And Niels Bohr said that if quantum mechanics has not profoundly shocked you, then you haven't understood it yet. Now in this series, we will go deeper into the quantum phenomena and the implications that it has on our path towards our potential. But for now, just realize that there is a world beneath this world. The fabric of our reality is much more peculiar than we've thought. This fabric responds to our thinking. It engages with our consciousness and it exists all around us. So where do we begin in such a weird and trippy world? Well, humbly, I believe we begin right where we're at. No more, no less. By removing the obstacles that we have placed in our own way. Aeschylus, a Greek playwright, said that from a small seed, a mighty trunk may grow. So that seed of your potential will grow into a mighty tree that can withstand thousands of storms. This potential exists within you right now. So what I'm asking of you is to see more in that mirror than just the flesh and blood staring back at you. I want you to remember that you are far more than you've ever considered. You are actually your entire impact upon this planet. This is why the Native American Indians, when their council would sit and speak about the future of their tribe, they had one credo that they would adhere to most of all. They said, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact that our decisions will have upon the next seven generations. Meaning long after you're gone, your impact on this world will still be ringing. So instead of just leaving you with a bunch of intellectual, conceptual ideas to toss around, I want to leave you with some real practical tips and tools that you can take and employ right now. On a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. On the left side, write down some things that you feel are impossible for you right now. Things like, it's impossible for me to run a mile or get married. Meditate for a moment on what you've written. Then on the right side of the page, write down the first solution you think of for each of these doubts. Be practical. Try to stick as close to the things that are just out of reach instead of finding the most extreme examples of impossibility. We're not claiming to be superheroes just yet. And throughout the week, come back to this list and reevaluate your doubts and see day by day how they change. If you employ these tips just a few times before you see me next, you will begin to demystify what you believe is impossible and hopefully have realized that it is only your doubts that keep you from living to your full potential. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you next time on Limitless.